Good evening, it's lovely to welcome you along to Gordon Community Church and we would have filmed outside. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful day, the sun is shining and it's uh, warm. Unfortunately, when I started recording, uh, my neighbour decided to strim his back garden and it was a bit um, noisy in the background so we decided to move inside again. This morning, this evening, we're going to look at a character who is not mentioned in Scripture. And we have looked at different people from the Old Testament, then we moved into the New Testament, and now we're coming nearer the time in which we live, although it won't be that much nearer. Um, it still would be about 1,500 years ago. Um, but before we do that, let's just come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence again. And Father, just be with you and sit with you and learn from you. Father, just to worship you and bring our offering to you. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that still affords us to meet in such a way. So, Father, we pray that you would be with us this evening. Lord, that you would um, send your Spirit, and Father, that you would draw alongside us, and as we come, that we would receive your blessing from your Word. And so, Father, we just look in anticipation to see what you have got to share with us this evening. And again, we would just ask these things in thy son's precious name. Amen. As I said, we're moving a little closer to the time of uh, the time in which we live. And one of the things that we're thinking about in regards to this is, does the experiences, does the faith, the radical faith that we have read about in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, can and does this happen in the day in which we live? And we'll th move through history um, very quickly, I might add, but we'll move through his history and look at different people down through history and just see if there was still that moving of the Holy Spirit and that movement of deep, deep faith. The, this evening we're going to look at someone called Monica, who was um, made a saint, so obviously she became Saint Monica. She was born into a Christian family, family in North Africa in a played place called Tagaste, which is in what we would call um, Algeria, and this was around 333 AD. She did get married to someone who um, was a pagan and that was his religion and his name was Patriotius and really he was only a pagan by name. And when we read the different accounts of Monica's life then we see that he didn't really treat his wife with um, respect or really didn't treat her in any decent way at all. Um, he did have a bad temper, he was violent, and as stated that he lived a life full of sensual pleasures. So it is reported that um, Monica didn't have a good married life. She did have three children. One of them was Augustine, who was the eldest, and then Navigus the second, and a daughter called Petula. One interesting fact is that her son Augustine nearly died <coughs> at a very, very young age. And because her husband was a pagan, then he wouldn't allow his children to be baptised. Thankfully, he relented um, with Augustine and Monica thought that she was going to 
have him baptized when he was really ill at a young age. Unfortunately, in one sense, um, fortunately in another, Augustine started to get better, but because he was getting better then, her husband relented on that and he didn't get baptised. He eventually was sent to a school, um, a religious school, and it is interesting, which we'll pick up on later, that Monica wrestled with God for his soul. Again, Augustine fell into previous sin and Monica went to the bishop for help. And the bishop of that time said these famous, famous words, the child of those tears will never perish. The child of those tears will never perish. At the age of 31, Augustine converted to Christianity. And we're going to take three points from Monica's story this evening. We're going to look at, first of all, wrestling with God, and then we'll look at persistence, and then finally we'll see that she knew her purpose in life. So, first of all, wrestling with God. Let's come to Genesis chapter 32, and we'll read 10 verses in Genesis 32, beginning at verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants and eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When, he, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint and he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no be longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and because, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, and he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day people of Israel do not eat the sinew, of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. This is really an interesting story, but really I think to get the best or understand this story and understand who Jacob was, we need to see what initially, not after he was named Israel of course, but initially characterised his life. When we read some of the commentaries then, they would tell us that he was a determined man. Some would actually go as far as call him, um, say that he was actually ruthless. He was a con artist, a liar, a manipulator. In fact, the name Jacob not only means deceiver, but more literally it means grabber. So we can see why there would have been a, a need 
for this man to wrestle with God or God wrestle with this man. I'm not saying that Augustine was as bad as this, but certainly he went back to previous sins that he had committed. And we read that his mother knew that he had wandered away from the faith and really wandered away from what seemingly was a close relationship with God. I wonder this morning, what camp is it that we are in? Are we like Monica, who actually knows someone who is far from God, or who has wandered away from God, and that weighs hard on our hearts? Or are we like Jacob, and we have wandered away from God. Or are we like Augustine, who had wandered away from God? Maybe it's because of situations or things that has happened in our life. Frederick Bucher, one of the most read authors by Christian authors, certainly in America, characterizes Jacob's divine encounter at the Jabok River as the magnificent defeat of the human soul at the hands of God. It's in Jacob's story we can easily recognize our own elements of struggles, fears, darkness, loneliness, vulnerabilities, empty feelings of powerlessness, exhaustion, and relentless pain. It is only when Jacob confronted God and wrestled with him and actually was crippled that he received God's blessing. It was only when Monica wrestled in desperation poured out her soul for many years that she saw her son come to faith. And by the way, this son, Augustine, is the person who we know of as Augustine of Hippo. And if we look at his life after he comes to faith, after his mum pours continuously pours out her soul over her son, we realise that he became one of the best known theologians and scholars of his time. You know, I wonder, do we take it upon ourselves to wrestle with God and his will for our lives? Or do we take it upon ourselves to wrestle with God, to pour out our soul to God for the lives of others? We learn also as Christians, despite our trials and tribulations, our strivings in this life, are never devoid of God's presence. They are never devoid, our lives are never devoid of his blessings and inevitably um, this follows the struggles that we have. The blessing usually follows the struggles that we have, which can sometimes be messy and can be chaotic. chaotic. Real growth experiences always involves struggles and pain. Jacob's wrestling with God at the Jabok that dark night reminds us of this truth. Though we may fight God and his will for us, in truth, God is very good. As believers in Christ, 
we may well struggle with him through the loneliness of the night. But the beauty of it is, daybreak will come and it will be followed by his blessing. And then we come to a second point. And I've entitled this um, Persistence. In the life of Monica, one thing that is evident is the fact that she never gave up on her son Augustine. Why I didn't say at the beginning, why I didn't say this at the beginning was the fact that not only did she keep seeking God's face, but she physically followed him wherever he went to try and convince him, uh, try to convince him what was best for him. She followed him to Rome and then he went his own way to Milan and yes, she followed him to Milan as well. There are a lot of examples in scripture when it comes to persistence or we could say perseverance. The Apostle Paul highlights this in Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 28. Five, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles and danger in the city, danger in the wilderness and danger at sea, danger from false brothers and toil and hardship, though eh, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure of me, of my anxiety, for all the churches. So we see the kind of pressures, we see the kind of dangers that followed Paul. But despite this, he kept focusing on one thing, and that focus was Jesus, and of course, it was the goal that was ahead of him. We could also look at the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. It says, He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to him, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because his widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continuing coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not give justice to his elect, and will cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to him speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth. You know, I am convinced that persistence will not only lead to faith, but persistence will also answer, uh, lead to answered prayers in our prayer life. We see many examples of this. We see the example of that in Monica's life. We see the example of that down through Scripture. 
as well. And the interesting thing is, and I've, I've mentioned this before, if we look at the great chapter on faith um, in Hebrews chapter 11, and we look at verses 38 to 39, it says this, And all these, though commended through the faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should be made perfect. So we see that they may never have seen Monica did, the Apostle Paul did, but some of them never saw the results of their faith. But that didn't stop them. They continued in doing what was before them, what they were focused on. And yes, there will be something better than seeing the results. And then we come to our last point, which is she knew her purpose in life. You know, when we think of Monica, we realise that she could have lost focus and really would have had good, a good excuse to lose focus on a few occasions. Whether it was abuse from her husband, the fact that her son um, wanted to go away, the fact that um, her husband wanted her to give up her faith and go with him in paganism. The fact that her son went to another country. Many, many opportunities to lose focus on what God had given her. But you know, the beauty of it is she didn't lose focus. And the benefit of that is not only did she see her son coming to faith, but we can benefit from the treasures that Augustine of Hippo has left for us. Peter shows us the importance of staying focused on the goal ahead. He walks on water and he shifts his focus from Jesus to the wind and the waves that surround him. And what happens? Because he loses focus, he begins to sink. If we focus on Jesus, we don't sink. If we focus on Jesus, then the storms of life may still surround us, but they won't affect us. If we focus on Jesus, then we will find and reach our final goal. It's interesting to see that if it wasn't for Augustine's mother, then we would never have benefited from his knowledge. Sometimes for us to see the blessing, then we need to wrestle with God. We need to pour ourselves out before God. We need to pour our souls out on behalf of someone else. And we need to keep persevering in this. And let us not lose focus of our goal. Maybe God has given you a focus God has given you. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe you've not realise that focus as of yet. But pray to God to give you a focus. And if you have a focus, then keep on going with that. You know, if we think about this um, in the terms of an athlete, if an athlete gives up the focus of him winning or her winning the Olympics or a special event, the World Championships, or if a footballer loses focus on winning the, the, the league title or the World Cup, if they lose focus on that and stop their training as it were, 
they will never reach that goal. They need to persevere to that. They need to keep pouring themselves into that. They need to keep applying themselves to that. And if they do that, then eventually there is a fair chance they will reach that goal. It's the exact same with us. We need to pour our souls into these things. And as I said, if we've not got a focus, let's pray to God for us to find a focus. And I am sure he will give us that. So we see in the life of St. Monica that because of her dedication, because she wrestled with God, because she kept her focus, then not only did her son become a Christian and find faith, but we actually benefited from his knowledge. So we give God thanks for that. And before we listen to our final hymn, let's just come before God in prayer. Father, we thank you that <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we can concentrate on one thing. Father, we thank you that you give us that focus. Lord, we thank you for the compassion that Monica had for her family to see them coming to faith. Lord, we thank you that we can have that same, we have got that same compassion for people who surround us, might be family, might be friends. Lord, let's keep our focus, help us to keep our focus on that. And Lord, as we go our, certain, our, our separate ways, Father, we pray that you would go with us and watch over us. And again, we just ask these things in thy son's name. Amen. As the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. I said 